We are so glad you have chosen to join with us, whether it's on the Instagram live feed as we're doing it, or later on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, the many ways that we use online platforms right now to try to reach people. Online ministry is not really what we want to do right now, but since we're still not able to meet as a group, it's what we've got, and we're going to let God use that, we're going to let God work in and through that. So tonight we're going to continue a series that we started a few weeks ago that we're calling Rooted and looking at basic roots of our Christian faith, deepening our faith through certain core roots. And tonight we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about what that means. This message is called Upside Down. And if you have a Bible, don't turn it upside down, but turn it to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to look at the Beatitudes and how that flipped the world upside down. We're also going to take a moment, we're going to pray for the Banjar people of Indonesia, and we're going to pray for Trent Latham, who is working with a church plant in the Boston area. So let's take a moment and let's do that. Father, I thank you for the Banjar people of Indonesia. I thank you that there are a few of them who know you, and I pray that they would be bold and would share their faith. And I pray that the good news of the message would reach them, and that it would spread, and it would be good news, that the gospel would be good news, it would take hold in their hearts, it would change their lives, and you would use it to reach others through them, and that those who, who do know you would be bold in sharing you. I thank you for Trent for the brief amount of time I was around him when he was a student at Arkansas Tech and when he was a part of ministry at Dardanelle First Baptist. I pray that you would continue to use him as you've called him to the Boston area, that you would give him strength, that you would give him wisdom, that you would use him to reach people who don't know you and, and in the ministry you've given him in that church there in that area. Thank you for him. Thank you for how you're using him. In Jesus' name, amen. If we were meeting together, we would pray. We would, we would have prayed for those people, but we also would have begun with a worship song. And tonight's worship song that we would have started with, it's called My Heart is Yours by Christian Sanfield. It's just a wonderful song of surrender to the Lord. So uh, look that up, sing it on your own, pour your heart out to the Lord, make it your prayer that your heart is yours, that your heart is surrendered fully to him. As I said tonight, we're going to talk about the kingdom. We're going to talk about how it flips life upside down when Jesus talks about the kingdom. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, but before we get there, I want us to kind of think about this idea. We, we grow up with this idea that the world, there, there has to be more to it. We, we get the sense that there's more than what we can see. If movies are any indication, most people think that there's something more. Most people think there's something beyond just what we can see, beyond just what we experience in our day-to-day -day life. Think about it for a minute. How about the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where a wardrobe, a, a dresser type thing, becomes a portal into another world? Or think about all the superhero movies and how... There's superheroes hiding in plain sight among us in our schools and in our workplaces and things like that. Those may be far-fetched, they may seem far-fetched, and they may not be reality, but they ring true to us nonetheless. The world we live in day to day seems superficial at times and our hearts cry out for something more. We want there to be something more and we think that there has to be something more than this. Scripture gives us a peek behind that curtain. It, it gives us a peek into the world beyond the world that we can see. And I'm going to read first from Luke chapter 17. Um, this is from verse 20 and 21 of Luke chapter 17 to kind of kick it off. And then we'll get over to Matthew chapter 5 and how it flips the world upside down. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming with something observable. No one will say, See here or there, for you see the kingdom of God is in your midst. See, it isn't just some future paradise waiting for us out there in the sweet by and by. It isn't just some hope down the line. The Bible says that it's something that we're living right now. It's not really a place on earth or heaven, but it's really wherever the presence of God is, wherever God is king, wherever people worship him. And as Christ followers, we live in sort of this in between this already not yet. The kingdom of God is down the line in heaven and our life with God eternally, but it's also present right here. And we are a part of that presence right here. And we are a part of making life better in the here and now. It makes our everyday lives more significant. It adds depth. It adds meaning. It adds weight to our lives, to our actions, to our decisions. And when we embrace kingdom life, we begin to look at small stuff differently. We begin to realize the weight that every decision makes, the weight that everything that we do carries. And we start to live by God's value system instead of the world's tainted values. And God's value system is so different than the world's value systems. And when Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 5, it shows us how he flips things upside down. It shows us how he turns the value systems of our world upside down. Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, his longest teaching moment. He spoke in something we call the Sermon on the Mount. And it says that he went up onto a mountain when he saw the crowds. And after this, he sat down and his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice, for your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its taste, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. And in the middle of that, something we call the Beatitudes, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are merciful, who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers, who are persecuted. All of those things flip the world's values upside down. We get a, key, a glimpse into the kingdom values, but they're very different from what you see at school. Very different from what you see at work. Very different from what you see portrayed in the media, other places in the world. Jesus turns the values, the world's priorities, the world's way of living life upside down. Things aren't always as they seem. First becomes last. Last becomes first. Money is not worth much, but character is priceless. None of these things that he lists would show up on a secular list of things that you should strive for, things that you should live your life for, things that you should chase after in your life. Values and priorities in the world, they're different. Humility lets us come near God the King, the least, the awkward, the misfits. They're all priceless in the kingdom of God. And they're nobodies. And the kingdom is for nobodies. The kingdom is for children and women and prostitutes and tax collectors and the ill and anybody and everybody. It's not just the cool and the hip and the big and the bad and the brightest and the best. It's for nobodies. And that's people like us. And when nobodies are let in, they're welcomed with open arms and open hearts. And they're given access to Jesus himself and to this radical upside down kingdom made out of useless, fumbling, weak, incapable, worthless sinners who've been transformed by grace alone. And through that transformation, show the power of God and show how great he is and show how unstoppable he is. His power in us, something that we can only boast in because of him. We only boast in our Lord. And that's upside down from the world. That's upside down from what we're taught from childhood on to rise to the top. And Jesus says, be a servant. And Jesus says, don't be like this, be like this. In God's kingdom, inward change matters. The eternal matters more than, than, than the here and now, than temporal gains. The inward change matters over outward appearance. Ultimately, a lot of the Beatitudes is about this. It's about inward change and eternal. It's about emptying ourselves and realizing our need for God. It's about relying on God for our sustenance. Life is not about what you put on for people on the outside. Later in Matthew, Jesus calls out the Pharisees for putting on a mask, for putting on things that don't match who they really are, for putting on a front that's not who they really are. Life's not about what you put for people on the outside. It's not about outer appearances. It's not about what we gain in the moment. It's not about what temporarily satisfies and then goes away. Everything mentioned in this passage is things that happen on the inside. What affects lasting change? What makes us more dependent? What makes us more needy of Jesus and dependent upon him? It turns the world's values upside down. We find real life change. We find real life and real change on the inside. Because of Jesus, not because of worldly gain, not because of things that satisfy for the moment. We value servanthood over power. The world tells us to chase after power. I'm wearing a Michael Jordan shirt, and I loved Michael Jordan as a kid. Loved watching the documentary, The Last Dance. But Michael Jordan kind of was a bully to people. He kind of worked his way up by pushing others down, trying to make them their best. Yes, but he was kind of ugly in how he did it. And that's the way most of our world works, trying to climb the corporate ladder, trying to get what we want, trying to get mine, trying to get my rights, trying to do all of this. Jesus says that we're to value servanthood over power. We treat others the way that we want to be treated. We show we value them. We care for others by showing a concern for them. We prioritize Jesus over everything. We value him over everything else. We put him in first place above and beyond everything else. We are servants of him and servants of other people. We learn to filter everything else through the lens of Jesus. Whatever we think, whatever we do, does it match up to Jesus? Would it please him? Would it honor him? Would it glorify him? We don't just try to fit him in among a bunch of other things. Later in, this, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. 
value him above all else, and the rest of it falls into place. We make him first, and we allow his will to transcend and, and go above everything else in life. We also dare to be different, not just for the sake of being different. I mean, that's okay. I know a lot of people are like that. Maybe a lot of my youth group is even like that. A lot of teenagers I've met are like that. But we dare to be different, to not conform with the world, to not become exactly like the shape of the world around us. We can't talk like the world. We can't act like the world. We can't think like the world. We can't prioritize what the world prioritizes. We're weird. We're different. We're strange. The Bible calls us aliens. We're abnormal. We're oddballs. We're aliens and strangers in the world. The world won't understand the way of Jesus, and therefore they won't understand us. We dare to be different, not for the sake of being different, but because we are different. Because what we believe and what we think and what we act is different. That's the kingdom coming into our lives. When we grasp the kingdom of God, when we grasp the power of God's kingdom, when we grasp that it's already and not yet, that it's a hope down the line for heaven, but a hope right now as we live life here and now, we're called to engage the world with it and to bear lasting fruit with it. There's enough of a difference in us from those who follow Christ to those who don't follow Christ in the world that it shows, that it shows in a difference, that it shows in the fruit of our labor. An apple produces apple. If we're truly following Christ, we'll produce Christ-likeness. We follow Christ-likeness, we follow Christ. It's not a flash in the pan moment. It's not something that we pray a prayer and then walk an aisle and then nothing ever changes. It lasts, it's long-term, it's legitimate. It has long-lasting fruit results. We're called not to hibernate from the world, but to share the story of Jesus with the world, but to, to share the hope that we have with the world that's crying out for hope, with the world that's crying out for meaning and purpose and hope. We share it through our words. We share it through our actions. We're called to show his love and we're called to share his story. We're asked to be his ambassadors, his representatives to a world that desperately needs him to be represented to them, that needs to see him and needs to know him. And so the question for us is, will we do that? Will we live like that? Will we talk like that? Will we share that? Will we show that love? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus outlines the primary attributes of people who receive the kingdom that he brings. In fact, there's nine direct references to the kingdom in the sermon, calling for humility, a willingness to suffer persecution, earnest attention to God's commands, refusal to substitute false piety for genuinely right, right behavior, a call to a life of prayer, prioritizing spiritual over material, and above all, acknowledging the lordship of Christ by obeying the will of God as he reveals it to us. In short, the kingdom of God is upside down. It's backwards. It's flipped. It's radically different, and that's a good thing. And we need to thank God for the bigger story. We need to thank God for the kingdom where love and mercy reigns over success and over status. We need to ask God to help us see with a kingdom perspective and to live out the kingdom values in our everyday life. Does your life reflect the kingdom? Does your life reflect that you have a hope that, that came from Jesus that's different from what the world has? Man, if there's ever been a time in history that the world needs to know that and needs to see that genuinely from believers, it's right now. They need to see the difference that Jesus makes. They need to see the kingdom in us. They need to see the kingdom is not just some pie in the sky thing down the line, hope in heaven that we have. And it is that, but it's not just that. It makes a difference right now. It makes a difference here and now. And when we have that, we show it and share it to the world and we glow and shine as lights in the world. If we were to be together, we would have closed tonight with a worship song called Glow by the Digital Age. And it's really a modernizing, in a sense, of this little light of mine, taking our light and glowing, taking our light and shining in the world. So I want to pray for you guys as we wrap up tonight that you will know the kingdom, that you will see the kingdom, that you will understand the kingdom, that you will understand that Jesus is radically different, that Jesus is so much more, that Jesus is so different and so non-conformed to the world, and it'll impact your life, and because it impacts your life and gives you hope, that you'll take it and share it and show it to the world. Father, I thank you for this time and I thank you for the Sermon on the Mount and especially the Beatitudes. And I thank you that we have hope because of Jesus through this, that it's something different, that it's something radically different to the world. And that's what we need right now more than ever, God. I pray that our lives would, would know that, that our lives would reflect that, that our stories would share that, our, our mouths would share that hope that we have with those around us. God, help us to be different from the world. Help us to live that radical, abnormal, oddball flipped upside down life that you call us to, the kingdom life you call us to. Thank you for giving us that hope. Thank you for giving us Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for, for being here, for watching, for listening, for wanting to follow Jesus, for wanting your life to be radically different. And I hope you'll do that and I hope we can help you in that journey. Thanks for being here. I love you guys. I miss you so much. See you later.